So, hello everyone, uh, we are doing a uh, module 4 on snoop based multiprocessor design. This is lecture number 2 where we are going to look at single level caches with an atomic bus. So, this is part 1 of the lecture or part 1 of the topic and then we will do lecture 3 as part 2 of the same topic. Okay, so, uh, in this whole module what are we trying to do? We are going to develop snoop based multiprocessors and the uh, various levels of abstractions as we uh, open up the layers, we will go from single level cache to multi level cache, atomic bus to a non atomic bus. Right? So, we are going to see all those designs one by one. So, in this uh, one, we are going to check at how do we design a single level cache which uses or runs on an atomic bus. So, while doing that, uh, actually how do we design the system? We have a processor, a cache that is the basic um, thing we study in a computer architecture or organization course. Now, when I want to integrate this for a multi-core which is cache coherent system, what changes do I need to do for the caches so that it becomes uh, friendly to run parallel programs across different cores. Okay? So, for doing this we need to understand any changes to be done to the cache. Then uh, we have been talking of uh, various snooping protocols which uh, communicate or uh, inform each other about uh, snooping results and they invalidate their blocks. So, while, while doing this or actually how is this implemented, so we are going to look at that aspect. Then what happens on write backs, do we need to really care about what happens there and once we come up with a design that is any small changes to a single core system which we will adapt for this snooping based multiprocessor uh, setup. So, once we have done that, then we will look at the correctness requirements which we looked in the lecture number 1 that is mainly uh, cache coherence correctness that is write serialization and sequential consistency correctness which is write completeness, write atomicity and then uh, other progressive correctness requirements like deadlock, live lock and starvation freedom. Right? So, this is what we are going to see in this topic single level cache on an atomic bus. Okay, so, the list uh, of changes which I will want to do in my design mainly comes on what changes am I going to do for the cache controller when I move from a uniprocessor cache to a multiprocessor cache, then uh, we always say snoop result. So, how am I actually going to implement this? Are there any race conditions I need to handle? And uh, yes, definitely all the memory accesses are in real implementation not atomic. So, when they are not atomic, what problems do they create? Are there further race conditions which I need to cater to. So, that we will look at and then finally, we will look at all the correctness aspects of uh, serialization, deadlock, live lock and starvation freedom. Okay. So, we will start with the cache controller. Right? So, we said that we are going to look at the cache controller, further we will look at snoop results, then any race conditions, lastly the correctness. Okay. So, cache controller and uh, subsequently the tag design. So, whenever uh, you are trying to understand this topic, keep relating to what is the basic design in a uniprocessor setup and what changes I am doing for making it adapt to a cache coherent multiprocessor setup. Okay, so, for that let us see what happens in a uniprocessor cache, so that we can incrementally change it. Okay, so, uniprocessor cache if you recollect uh, the lectures we have done, it consists of data, tag states right it has a comparator which is used for address comparison and then definitely the controller which is the main part which does all these tasks and all this is finally connected to the bus right so the cache communicates with the bus and of course with the processor and the uh, next level caches or the memory so that's the uniprocessor cache now this cache it interacts with the processor cache interacts with processor any request from the processor will be moved on to the next level of memory. So, what interaction happens at the processor level? Processor sends a request, we will check whether the tags match, whether it is a hit or a miss, depending on the hit or miss, we will either bring data or not and accordingly update the state bits. If we need the block, then we have to go to the memory uh, using the bus interface and then fetch the data. If we are writing back a block, again we have to go on to the bus interface to the memory to write back the data. So, this is the interaction of the cache 
with the processor. So if I say this is the microprocessor, this is the interaction I am talking about. Now the cache is connected to the bus, so it also interacts uh, with the bus controller. Now when it in has to initiate a uh, bus operation that is to write back a data or uh, sending a request to read, again it is not a single thing it does. There are several small things which happen or it is rather a not a complete atomic action. Okay? So the cache controller when it talks to the bus it first has to assert a request. So you have to send a request to the bus then you will be granted the bus after we get the grant then we have to send what action I want to do. Okay? So first send the request, wait for the bus grant, once you get the grant give the address you are considering to read or write and then the command what are you supposed to do, are you going to read the data or you want to write to the data. Okay? So the address and command go onto the bus, once this goes there is some receiving device which will understand that a command that is if it is memory, memory will understand that this is the address it is supposed to cater to and do read or write. So there will be somebody who accepts your request and this device will then be involved in your data transfer either receiving the data or sending the data. So just one bus operation is now divided into five things and you will now realize that all these five things must happen one after the other and in an atomic bus I assume that all of these five will happen together without any other disturbance in the middle. Right? So in this topic I am assuming an atomic bus so all of them are going to finish in one go before a next bus transaction can take place. Okay, so this way we are going to extend the uniprocessor cache. So uniprocessor cache is nothing but a finite state machine. Okay, every hardware this system has to be implemented using a state machine. Then the transactions which happen on the bus, you will also realize that there are five things and lot of interactions. So that is also an FSM. So the sequence of steps related to the bus, sequence of steps related with the processor, both of these are finite state machines. And now don't confuse this with the coherence protocol FSM, right? So coherence protocol was a third FSM which was a block level FSM for every cache block, okay? So overall there are now three FSMs which we are uh, considering here. Then the uniprocessor cache has to monitor the bus as well as respond to the processor request. So till now we were only considering that the uniprocessor cache accepts request from the processor and then responds to the processor and then uses the bus to do some data transfer, right? bringing data or sending data. But when I put this uniprocessor cache in a multi-core cache coherent system, there are requests coming on the bus which I have to cater to right? because some other processor wants a block and this current processor has it. So if a bus read x transaction goes onto the bus, this uniprocessor cache which was initially not worried about looking what happens onto the bus, now it is supposed to look onto the bus, snoop onto the bus and see whether the request is applicable to this processor. So the controller also has to look at the bus uh, happenings right now. Okay? So we have to look at the processor side request and also monitor the bus while implementing the uh, protocol. Okay. So to implement snooping protocol, we essentially will have a FSM which looks uh, caters to the processor request and an FSM which caters to the bus request. Now when I have these two FSMs which I am discussing, they will be uh, wanting to compare the addresses. So processor sends the address request as well as something goes onto the bus and that also reaches to the controller. Now the controller needs to compare this address, now processor wants uh, to compare as well as the snooper or the snooping controller also wants to compare. So the tags is one storage which is in high demand. So if both of them want to compare, they will do it sequentially. So this is going to add to the latency. If the processor is stalled, it is definitely not desirable. Hence, we conclude that when I move a uniprocessor cache to a cache core and multiprocessor system, I need to do something for the tag storage. And what we are going to do? We are going to duplicate the tag storage. Okay. So processor is comparing, snoop is also comparing the tags and hence I am going to use two storages that is 
use a dual tag array definitely I'm not going to duplicate the data okay data is a single copy but tags will be duplicated or we can use a dual ported RAM for the tags so you can have two ports which will give you parallel access to the tags okay so while we are doing all of this uh, will guarantee that the processor is not stalled for a long time there will be only cases when there is some uh, these both tags I have two tag arrays so these two tag arrays t1 and t2 when they need to update each other only those cases is where everything will be stalled but otherwise routinely it will go faster the common case is very fast okay so this is uh, how the design will look like we have the cache data and then we duplicate the tags so this is a set of tags on the bus side and this is a set of tags for the processor side so when processor says it goes to the blue box to compare and when the bus snooper wants to see it checks the yellow box and at the bottom I have just for representation given that there are some FSMs right I have just left them empty to show that this is some abstract diagram there is a bus side finite state machine there is a processor side finite state machine and definitely a block level coherence finite state machine okay so all these machines have to interact with each other to make the whole system work so now the cache controller is extended with two caches sorry two tag arrays and it also has to do something more now what's that extra feature so initially we were only comparing addresses here so when an address comes we were comparing the tags there and now something comes onto the bus so now when an address comes onto the bus we are also supposed to compare those addresses with this yellow storage okay so we need uh, extra comparators to do this and not only compare if there is a hit that is if we have the block in our cache so the tags say there is a cache hit then we may have to put the data onto the bus if we have modified the data or we can simply change the state in case it's a read only block okay so in an update based protocol I also have to pick up the data from the bus so the two added features to uniprocessor caches the first thing is I should be able to put data onto the bus which the uniprocessor cache never did what did uniprocessor cache it only put the data on write backs but here in a snooping friendly cache I have to put the data on demand from the bus snooper so when bus says give me data we have to give data and the second thing it has to do is pick up the data also uniprocessor cache only brought data from the memory whereas a multi-core cache coherent processor cache has to pick up the data on demand from the bus in case an update for the block is going okay so these are the two added features and that will extend my cache controller okay so we've added two features to my cache controller now we will look at the next aspect of snooping results so now what is this uh, we were saying that among the shared data when we transfer uh, sorry when we have to read or write we will send a bus request right? a bus read or a bus read x transaction and subsequently some other cache is going to uh, say that whether they have the copy or not okay because we need to know whether there are other sharers multiple occasions would need this information the simplest example comes to my mind is when you want to read and nobody has the share data then we can load the data into the e that is exclusive state in the messy protocol other uses also of this right so when a transaction goes on to the bus all the caches have to respond to this transaction either they say they have the block or they have to say they do not have the block so this is called snooping result so we have to declare the snooping results whenever a bus transaction takes place now how are we going to declare this so the first question is when should we tell this answer and then how should we tell this answer so when is time dependent and how is what is the design change I'm going to do so we are going to see these two aspects okay and the first question is when do we declare snoop results and why is this important this is important because if uh, the memory which is connected to the interconnect it has to decide whether it should give the block or some other cache is going to give the block 
alright. So, if there is a sharer having modified the data that cache is going to provide to the new reader. If there is no sharer which changed data then the memory has to give. So, in any case the memory has to always be alert to decide whether it should give the data or some cache is giving. So, this decision has to be done quickly ok. So, that is why we have to have a method for doing this. So, I am going to consider three options of this when answer ok. So, I am going to say that let me keep a fixed delay before the memory decides that it has to give or not. Let the delay be optimistic that is variable and a third option is immediately ok. So, these are the three options we are going to consider. So, using this we are making sure that the memory will know whether it is giving the block or some cache is giving the block. Let us take the first option of fixed delay. So, now the snoop results will come in a fixed delay. When we say fixed delay we have to say how many clock cycles. So, you will have to find out how many clock cycles does it take for the snooping controller to go to the tag array, compare the address, declare a hit or a miss and then send the answer onto the bus. Okay. So, to reduce this delay we are definitely using dual tags so that we do not contend with the processor, we have our separate tag storage to compare. But we still need to be conservative because in case we went to the yellow side tag array, the processor might be changing the tag or state so that both the tag arrays are currently locked. So, we have to be slightly conservative when the CPU might be changing some state of the tags. However, we can still derive a reasonable conservative assumption about the number of cycles required to do this. So, once we have this, we know that after n number of cycles, my snoop results will be available onto the bus. Okay. So, what is the advantage of this? The advantage is that the main memory is not affected at all because the main memory simply waits and I am saying suppose you wait for 8 cycles, just an example. Okay, so, memory waits for 8 clock cycles and until 8 clock cycles if no snooping result come onto the bus, it decides that yes it has to give the data. If some answer comes then memory does not do anything ok. And the cache to cache transfers are also easy. So, if there is a cache which has the block it can simply put it on the bus and the reader can utilize this data ok. Disadvantage is that you need some extra hardware for doing this and potentially some longer latency because we are doing a conservative estimate of uh, the delay. This is uh, a very useful method and if definitely implemented in real systems like the Pentium Pro, the HP server and the Sun Enterprise, these three machines use this fixed delay based snoop result ok. Second option variable delay. Now, variable delay how much different and how do you decide this? So, here we this is the best thing or the most optimal answer we can arrive at. So, how do you decide this? Mainly the memory is waiting if you recollect uh, we, memory is waiting to decide whether the cache is giving the block or memory is giving the block ok. So, memory says ok you I will not wait for for example, 8 clock cycles, but uh, I will wait until you tell me you are not going to give because if I keep a fixed delay maybe some caches are fast, maybe some caches are slow, so, but you always have to wait for that much time. But in case the caches are fast enough and I get the snoop results in 3 cycles for example or 3 time units, then the memory can quickly decide in lesser time than the fixed delay. So, here the memory says I will wait until all the caches tell me that whether they are giving the data or they are not giving the data. So, this is uh, of course, less conservative hence we do not have to wait for the worst case delay and hence most fastest. So, it is flexible, but once you bring in flexibility the design becomes complex. Now, what is the complexity of the design? Here the cache has to talk with the memory which is an added feature where as it is modifying the uniprocessor cache to be able to adapt to a multi core system. Now, we are saying the cache also should talk to the memory which is connected far off onto the interconnect. So, we need to establish a handshake between the cache and the memory ok. So, this is uh, extra work. The other optimization people try here is that the memory is very impatient it says let me bring the data because I am a slow person, let me bring the data in the meanwhile the caches will decide what they want to do. So, the data is almost ready with the memory, if the caches say they are providing the data memory says ok I will not give you this data, otherwise memory puts that data onto the bus. So, we can have this optimization also implemented. So, for a variable delay 
the memory assumes that the cache will give until they say otherwise, until they say I am not going to give. It is less conservative, more flexible, complex implementation because now the cache and the memory will talk with each other. So, extra work to do. Optimization is we can uh, start fetching the data from the memory bank and if the caches give the data, we can simply discard the memory fetch or stall the memory fetch. This method is implemented in the SGI challenge processor. Third is immediately. Now, this is uh, coming like a magic. How do I do? Because initially I was saying it will take some 8 to 10 clock cycles or lots of time. Then in the variable, we are saying that let the caches tell me whether I'm giving it or not. So, how do I come up with the third option of immediately? So, immediately is the memory decides whether it is giving or not immediately. That is the memory knows whether the cache will give or not. Now, how will the memory know this? Right? So, memory is here. It has to know whether the block B which I am accessing or which is being sent for whom the request is sent onto the bus, should I give the block or not? That is, will the cache give this block or not? Okay, so for memory to be able to decide this in one clock cycle or immediately is that memory maintains a map as to which caches have this block. So, if the memory knows which cache has the block, memory will know that yes, that cache can give. If no cache has it, then memory has to give. Right. So, immediately I can decide if I put one bit per cache block indicating whether a cache has it and whether it has been modified. So, if a cache has it and in a dirty state, then that particular cache is ready to give that data. So, this option is good, but uh, it is ex uh, expensive because this ends up adding this extra hardware to the memory and memories are normally considered to be more commodity devices and we do not want to change them based on the type of protocol and based on the type of variations which we are discussing, right? So, we do not want to touch the memory, let it be as generic as possible and hence mostly we do not prefer this option, but this is also one good option to think of, okay? So, disadvantages, we need extra hardware and we have to modify the memory subsystem, which is a big disadvantage, okay? So, these are the three ways in which I can uh, report the SNOOP results. The next question is, how am I going to give these results? We discussed when the results will come. Now, how are they going to come? How are they going to come? Meaning, I have a messy protocol and in this messy protocol, when a request goes onto the bus, suppose it is a bus read X, then uh, we were saying that if somebody has the block, put that block onto the bus. If nobody has, then we can load it into the E state and so on, right? So, the result has to come in some format. So, whether the block is dirty, whether the block is shared, all this information should come so that I can take appropriate actions whichever are required. So, I need to know whether the block is shared so that uh, we can load in the correct state. I need to know whether somebody has the block in dirty mode. Why? Because that cache is going to give me the data and not the memory, okay? So, memory should also know that it should not give the data. So, we have to give these two answers onto the bus, okay? So, for that, if you recollect, we had discussed the shared, wired or signal earlier that every cache, if it has the block in S state, it will say yes. Suppose this says no, this one says yes, okay? So, everybody will put an answer and you can say that these all answers are collected to generate this final signal, okay? So, we have a wired or shared signal. This will say whether the block is shared or not. We can have a similar design for the dirty signal. Again, wired or any cache which has the block in dirty mode will raise it to 1. So, I have all these blocks, sorry, all these caches sending the answer. Suppose he says I am uh, the block and they do not have, then this bit will become 1. If this is 0, then the answer will be 0, okay? So, depending on the dirty status across the processors, your dirty signal will be generated, okay? So, this way I have integrated the two. So, we have the blue line telling about the dirty state, red telling about the shared state. Okay, and now the memory is waiting for this and accordingly memory should either give the block or not give the block. But when should the memory decide that the D and the S signals are ready? 
are these signals ready to be sampled? Have all caches finished the snooping? We do not know. Okay. So, how long should we wait for this D and S to come? So, for that we add a third signal which tells that whenever D and S are ready, it will say now D and S are ready, you can sample it. So, the third signal is called the snoop valid signal, this pink line. Okay. So, this pink line is normally set to 1 by default and when this is ready and this is ready, when both of them are ready, it will make this 1 to 0. Okay. So, when the pink line becomes 0, memory will decide whether it should give the block or not. Okay. So, this is how the snoop signals are implemented. So, you can see what all additions we are doing to uniprocessor cache. Earlier, we simply had the processor, the cache and the bus. Okay. Now, we have these three colorful lines getting added plus more decision logic also implemented. Okay. So, a summary here. So, we are going to use three wired or signals, shared, dirty and snoop valid which is an inhibit signal. Okay. So, this signal will remain high until the caches have completed their snoop and when the signal is deasserted, when it becomes low, the memory as well as the requester can then sample or examine the other two signals that is the D and the S signal they will sample to decide what to do. Next is who will provide the data. So, if some cache has the data dirty, that cache has to provide and if the cache does not have the data dirty, that is every cache has got the data in shared mode, right? everybody has in shared mode plus the memory is also connected to the bus, then who should give? So, in this case, it depends on the implementation. So, here we say that the initial Illinois Messi protocol allowed cache to cache transfers. So, block was provided by the cache and not the memory. So, here one of these caches will give the block to the new requester and the memory is not bothered. Okay. But when you have this, which of these caches will give? So, you need a priority scheme and a selection logic to do this. So, it makes the protocol complex. Okay. So, implementation of the protocol will become complex because memory is not going to give the data. You have to select among these three processors who will give the data. So, therefore, these commercial systems do not use so, they avoid using cache to cache transfers because the implementation will become complex. These two implementations SGI challenge and Sun Enterprise, they use the cache transfers only for modified data. That is if the data is changed only then they will use. So, SGI challenge says the cache which has the block in state M will give the data, but when it gives the data, it also changes the memory so that memory is up to date. The other variant is Sun Enterprise which says that the block which is in M state gives the data, but memory is not updated. So, you will not update the memory here. So, if you do not update the memory, then there has to be an owner which is implemented using the Moisey protocol with the O bit. Okay. So, only dirty blocks will be provided by the caches, clean blocks will be provided by the memory. So, that is the overall conclusion of who provides the data. Okay. Now, dealing with writebacks. So, writebacks actually do not interfere with any of your coherent logic because coherence comes into picture whenever we have something shared. right? So, if there is nothing shared uh, and I am writing back a blog because I am the only owner of this data, then there is no interaction with any other caches. So, dealing with writebacks uh, has to be handled because it is going to generate bus transactions and actually two of them. So, what do we do here? We first have to write this block to the memory and also bring the new block because I am right this block is being evicted from the cache. So, cache wants to remove the one block and bring the other one. So, there are two bus transactions happening here and to reduce the processor waiting time, we want to do the reads fast. Okay. So, what we will say write the write back happen later, but let me do the reads first. And then uh, this will add to some complications. Okay, so let's see uh, what is the scenario. So this is the cache. It has the block x equal to five, and now a read miss comes. So when a read miss comes, uh, before bringing y, we have to write the x. But I won't write the x all the way to the memory. But I will say put the write uh, x equal to five into the write buffer. 
So, what happens here? x equal to 5 comes and sits here. Eventually, it will go to the memory and in step number 2, I am going to bring y. So, this gets replaced with y equal to 88 and then the processor can begin using this. Okay. So, now what has happened? I have this extra entity which is holding some data which is not there in the cache and also not there in the memory. So, this adds to more issues because now the coherence logic or the snooping controller also should look at the write buffer. Okay. So, we have the processor cache the write buffer and the snoop controller which was initially only considering cache tags, it was only interested in looking at the tags of the cache, it is now also supposed to look at the write buffer. So, it has to check two things. Okay. See now we are adding more and more features to the cache controller. Okay. So, the snooper has to check the write back buffer as well as the cache tags. Another thing which can happen is this x was sitting here and in the meanwhile because of some uh, request coming onto the bus, this x was given by the write buffer. Okay, so, the x is no longer present inside this. So, here uh, the processor or uh, the controller was supposed to write back this x, eventually it had to write back this x to the memory, but in the meanwhile somebody else took this x because of uh, cache coherence, right. So, this was taken away and hence we have to cancel the write back. So, write backs also will have to be cancelled if they are picked up from the write buffer. Again, more logic to be implemented in the controller, right. So, uh, with this I have given you an overview of what all things uh, we need to make a uniprocessor cache capable of getting integrated into a cache coherent multiprocessor system. So, in part 2 of this lecture, we will look at the basic design organization and then the correctness requirements. Okay, so, we will stop this class here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.